Welcome back to Dr. Bruce. Today we take a much needed break from Bruce and return to the wisdom and teachings of Dr. Kaushik in this tour de force talk he gave in the late 1970s. In it, the doctor shows how our concept of God has undergone an evolution. That evolution started with animalistic and then angry human deities, then through compassionate avatars such as Jesus or the Buddha, but always these gods occupied a part of our mind that allowed them to manifest their opposite. This mind-opposite duality comes down to the persistent duality of the observer and the observed. In those rare moments, or for those rare people who are able to come to the end of thought, and for whom the observer disappears in merging together with the observed, the fundamental energy of the immensity pours in. In this state, the dualistic gods of the opposite have come to an end, replaced by a direct connection to the energy, the god within that infuses the universe. When the mind is confronted with problems of lack, of sorrow, of ill health, frustration, and limitation in every form, then it looks for an answer. It has been always looking for an answer. Throughout the ages, human mind has always been looking for an answer. In some cases, the mind has proceeded on an actual inquiry to look, looking at what is and going deeper and deeper and deeper. Or mind has projected hope for the opposite, that when there is a limitation, there must be also the unlimited. Because in the whole world of human mind, mind is confronted with the opposites. It sees heat, it sees cold, it sees happiness, it sees sorrow. It sees pain, it sees pleasure. So mind is, in its day-to-day -day life, is confronted by the opposites. And being so used to these opposites in life, it is just natural that one would think that nothing exists in this world, nothing exists in this life which doesn't have an opposite. And therefore, lack must have its opposite, limitation must have its opposite, disease must have its opposite, and sorrow must have its opposite. And thought is power. Human mind knows that through thinking it has created the world of day-to-day -day reality. So when mind sees something, realizes something that it exists, it finds out. And on this principle is based whole of magic. If you can formulate something with your imagination and concentrate on that formulation, that formulation takes a form. So much so, it is possible even to create the impossible, to realize the impossible. What you say is impossible. Yesterday we were talking of the possibility of going through the wall, if you can formulate the whole process and work on it, that impossible becomes possible. So it is within the power of the human mind to create the impossible. In actual fact, you can see the whole discovery of science, the whole history of scientific discovery is interspersed with events which were once considered impossible, but in course of time they became possible. So we are moving from impossible to possible. So that's very simple. There's nothing mysterious about it. Human mind, if it decides to do it, formulate it, can do it. But the only problem is when 
ever mind with its knowledge of limitation and lack has formulated the opposite. The opposite always had the seed of its own opposite. So by this formulation, mind could never discover if there is a factual immensity, if there is a factual abundance, joy, virtue, which has no opposite. So joy, which has its opposite as sorrow, is not joy. Virtue, which has its opposite as vice, is not virtue. Immense, which has its opposite as limited, is not immense. Then it is a real, real mystery, a real miracle to discover if there is such a thing as an absolute joy, an absolute freedom, an absolute immensity, an absolute truth which is not plagued by its opposite. Now, in the history of humanity, man has been always discovering the opposites of the limitation and lack. But sooner or later found that that abundance, that affluence was still lack. It was still lacking in something. And therefore, so long as the search has been for the opposites, the human problem could not be solved. Therefore, the search has to be directed in a different direction, not in looking for the opposites. You may posit a God which is unlimited as opposed to the limited human mind. You may posit a power which is omnipotent as compared with the human limitation. And you may realize this God. This God can be realized, which is omnipotent, which can do anything. And yet that God may be limited. Do you understand what is being said? And that's why when people have posited this omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent, and immortal God, they found that this God is limited. Now it's a very strange question. A God which is omnipresent, is omnipotent, is omniscient, is immortal, is limited. Can you understand? Very difficult to understand. How a God with all these attributes is limited? If this God does not have humility, but only power, it will be a God which will create itself a separation from the rest of the humanity. That's why you find there are so many living gods who declare their godhead, who declare that they are avatar or they are god. In that very declaration, they create a separation from humanity. That power becomes the limitation. A god which is omniscient and omnipotent and who has no weakness, who has no vulnerability, that god cannot be compassionate. Compassion comes out of understanding the limitation. And one who is absolutely potent, omnipotent, he may not know what, what weakness is. Can you understand what's being said? So, any image that you create, which is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, that image, opposite image of the limitation and ignorance and weakness, becomes a separation. And then the conflict between the opposite does not end. God in conflict with its creation. Therefore, in the Old Testament, God is always <laughs> destroying its own creation. It finds that whatever it has created is very meaningless. And therefore, God has to undergo an evolution. <laughs> so the perfect God which created the universe had to undergo a transformation and transformation was from power to weakness. How would you relent if you are not weak? How would you know how to surrender if you are not weak? How will a God 
make covenants and compromises with human beings if it has no weakness if it does not know any weakness why should he we only surrender when there is there is no choice if that god also had choice and it keep on destroying its creation and could live in conflict forever it did not have to compromise with its prophets so the god has to undergo a transformation and when god becomes a compassionate god god understands what weakness is god understands what sin is god understands what limitation is then that god is part and parcel of humanity do you see this interesting phase god has to undergo a transformation and even if you go to the to other traditions if you see the same tradition uh, say for example in the hindu tradition in the whole concept of these avatars the first avatars are having some animal forms and then they evolve they come to the human form and in the human form the first fully developed human avatar or incarnation of god is considered to be rama and parshuram so parshuram is a very angry man he just like the jehova of the old testament and it's interesting that this incarnation of god is prepared to kill the other incarnation of god which is rama they are both contemporaries and after parshuram or at the same time comes rama and rama is just like moses just like the old testament it is just evolution like that that rama has come to establish the law he is called maryada purushottam the highest among men who lives within limits who lives within a code of conduct so he establishes the norms of society and lives within those norms of society and now if you you might be conversant with this story rama is a king and his wife is abducted by a demon ravana but she does not submit to his threats and she remains pure and chaste but when she comes back when after de- defeating ravana Ra- rama brings her back she is put to a fire test you know in those ancient days there used to be a fire test if you are truthful fire won't burn you if you are a liar fire will burn you that was the test so she had to walk through fire and sita was not burned the wife was not burned and so it was established that she is pure and chaste once having undergone through the, the test when they return back to the kingdom and rama is going in a disguise at night to find out how his subjects how the people in his kingdom feel about the king to know their conditions at first hand he overhears a washer man and a washer woman quarreling the washer woman it seems had gone with some lover and she had come back and the washer man was saying look do you think i am ram that i'll keep you a woman who has stayed with a demon for so long i'm not like that king i'm not going to keep you so ram over here is and he says my god i thought in my kingdom everyone is happy but here is a man who is unhappy with my rule and as a king it was his duty to see that justice was done and everyone in the kingdom was happy and satisfied and so he said even if one man in my kingdom is dissatisfied this rule is no good and next day Rama banishes his queen Sita into exile because one man objects to her being the queen is a strange democracy you can see <laughs> one man can upset the apple cart of the whole of the majority 
Now, the only question is here a God incarnate who is worshipped by the Hindus, who has such great virtues, who has never swerved from the path of truth and duty, who has always followed the commandments and law of dharma, turns away his wife, banishes his wife, who is innocent. So, when you are following the law, it is very difficult to be merciful. The judges have no mercy, only the president has mercy. Judges have only law. In any country, the judges have no mercy. They don't pardon. Once they find somebody guilty, somebody who confesses, yes, I am guilty, there is no mercy with the judges. There is only punishment. Could be less or more, but punishment. No, no acquittal, no discharge. But the president, who doesn't represent the justice, but the compassionate aspect of the government, he has the prerogative to pardon, amnesty. So then after Rama comes Krishna, and Krishna goes beyond the social norms. He doesn't believe in social norms. He does things which are socially unacceptable. Playing around with other people's wives, having many queens, even sometimes telling lies if necessary. And he is still an incarnation of God. And a more perfect incarnation than Rama or Parshuram, according to the tradition. And then after Krishna comes Buddha. And the Buddha is an incarnation of compassion, not of law, but compassion. And strange, he talks of the law, he talks of the dharma, but his greatest dharma or law is the compassion. So if you can see this whole history, you can see that man has been experimenting with so many ideas of this divine, of this God, but none of those ideas could fit into reality. And with all these concepts and all with these notions, another difficulty arises. The question of good and evil. If the God is all-powerful, the God is omnipresent, omniscient, he knows everything, he is immortal, and he is good. God is good, God is not evil. Why does he create evil? If he created this world, why did he not create a beautiful world? Why did he create unhappy humanity? And Lord left it to the lords of these human beings, you and me, to find out what the truth is, what goodness is, what virtue is. And so intellectually it becomes difficult to understand how God who is perfect, how God who is good, creates a world which is not perfect, which is evil. And God being omniscient, if God knows everything, did he not know at the time of creation, when he created Satan, and he also created at the same time Adam, that Satan is not going to pay homage to Adam, not going to respect him. And not only that, Satan is going to disobey God. So God's creation getting out of his control. And when these things happen, it throws the doubt on the omniscience of God, if he really knew everything. So once you proceed with these ideas into running into opposites, you will find that the opposite contains the seed of the opposite. And it's not true God, it's not true, true immensity, it's only the opposite idea of human limitation. It can be realized, it can be brought into manifestation, it can be manifested. So human beings have tremendous power inside them. In the human mind there is tremendous power. If it can be unlocked, it can create marvels. And this is all at the level of thought. We have not gone beyond thought yet. We have not really seen what real creation is. It's still within the level of thought and human mind. So when you stop looking for God through the opposites, 
then what takes place? Do you understand the question? I as a human being have been looking for a God which is the opposite of what I am, whatever my mind is, whatever human beings are. And when I say I, it means the whole of human mind. You and me all combined, the whole of society. So when I posit the opposite, create this opposite, experience this opposite, live with this opposite, I still find at the end conflict still going on. And I am still interested in finding out if there is a God, if there is some truth, if there is some power, some energy, which is not relative, which is beyond opposites, which is not plagued by opposites, what does happen? What has happened to your mind and my mind when after tampering with all the opposites, playing with it, creating it, and seeing that the opposites are limited by each other, and then the human mind puts this question, if this opposite is not God, then what is? Can you put this question? Can you put this question in your mind? If you are moving with me so long, if you have been coming with me step by step, can you at this stage put this question? If the God created by thought, by positing the opposite, is not God, is not the Absolute, is not the Truth, then what is? You won't find the answer in any book. There is no one going to come and tell you the answer. You have looked around, you have read everything, the whole literature of the East and West, all the holy books, <laughs> seen the whole history of theological and mythological development, and seeing the whole of it, then you put this question. Then what happens? Please put this question. It's not a theoretical thing that we are discussing. I am talking something, an exploration. We are exploring together. It seems, Doctor, it would have to stop there. Hmm? It would have to stop there when you say, what is? We have to stop? There. Because if you continue on, then it would just be another, the thought would... We just be coming out of thought again. Please try if your thought can answer. So I'm saying the thought wouldn't be able to answer. Then wait. Then wait and wait and wait so long there is no answer. If you are if you've gone so far, you have seen the whole of it, and the human knowledge and human thought has re reached its limit. It has no answer then thought comes to a stop, stand still. In the silence, go deeper, sit down, explore. And as the mind goes deeper and deeper into the silence, and this is a real silence, is a silence of inquiry, not the silence of opposite, which is brought about by some mantra or some chanting or singing or some hyperventilation of your lungs by deep breathing or slow breathing. Once the opposites have been silenced, the still, stillness and quiet completely. And if the mind waits in the silence, goes deeper in the silence, it meets with an energy. And can you see this energy, whether it has any limits, whether it is inside or outside. Explore and find out your relationship with this energy. Can you feel some energy? Experience it. All right, now the question arises, as we started with this question of yesterday. This energy you are feeling on the silencing of your intellect. So more or less though the energy is experienced totally, but the opening up has taken place only on the intellectual level. 
the intellect is now free from the opposites and you can make these discoveries many times and each time you can come to the end of your thought on any problem you will contact the same energy so each time you make a discovery by exploring the frontiers of thought on any problem all that you know about that problem and thought comes to a stand still this energy is there and you can see very easily that your mind is freed from the search of opposites once this energy starts operating on the mind mind becomes free from search of opposites mind becomes free from the tendency to create opposite images and there is a relative freedom from conflict because on any problem you are not getting caught in the opposite seeking two things whenever you can look at any problem you will find the opposites disappear but the energy has not penetrated deeper into the psyche into the body it has not manifested completely what other changes would take place in the psyche or the body and though the contacting of this energy is timeless the moment the mind becomes still the energy is there it's a timeless experience is timeless manifestation it doesn't take time the time that you take is only to look at your problem from various angles exercising your intellect takes time but the manifestation of this energy does not take time but now if you are really going deeper into this energy the process begins in time my feeling is the process begins in time irrespective of what people might say in which the psyche and the body comes under the operation of this energy if you allow it to happen if you don't allow it to happen then the process may still take place but it will cause increased conflict in the psyche and physical disorder in the body if you don't allow it to take place the resistance is taking place somewhere do you understand what i'm saying you don't have to believe it or accept it please look at it and examine it and if you have any doubts please question what does it mean you don't allow it to take place if you say i have found my freedom it's all right i am fine i don't live in the opposites i live from moment to moment when the problem comes i look at it i still my mind my mind becomes quiet i am making discovery every day so every day you can sit down take some problem discuss see all its aspects alone or with a group of people and come to the experience of this energy experiences and you say look i experience something i had an experience of energy but still moving on the very superficial level so if you go into this energy into this inquiry again and again and again and again over a period of years or even for a shorter time if you are very sensitive you come to a relative freedom from conflict on the psychological level but whether conflict has ended on the physical level on the emotional level you cannot say whether disease has disappeared from your body disharmony has disappeared completely from your psyche you cannot say and so if this energy which has come into operation keep on operating and you keep on the path of inquiry and my feeling is once started you cannot turn back you have to move on and the energy is operating and you don't allow it to function completely operate completely through some resistance of an idea or a concept and thought is the resistance thought in one form or the other my feeling is thought is the that quality of matter which is called inertia and in, in i don't know whether that law is still true most of you might be knowing it it's newton's law of motion a body continues in a state of rest or of uniform motion unless 
acted upon by some external force. So inertia is not that you keep quiet or resting. Inertia is also if you are set in motion and nobody stops you, don't, you don't stop. So don't think that inertia means just lying quietly on the bed. Inertia is also you keep running unless somebody stops you. So if you are very speedy, that is also inertia. And if you are lying like a log of wood, that is also inertia. But that's the quality of inertia that once it is in any particular state, it does not accept a change. So matter doesn't accept change easily. Thought in one form or the other comes back again and again to survive. And it will not survive directly. It will survive in diverse ways. I can say, we have explored this observer and observed so many times. And whenever you look, and whenever you see on the nature of the observer, the observer comes to an end. But the question is, does the observer come to an end forever or for a moment? In the next moment again, the observer comes in another form, a new observer. And then you dissolve the observer and a new observer comes. And then you dissolve that observer and a new observer comes. So this hide and seek goes on endlessly. So then, you invent a philosophy of moment to moment. And a moment to moment philosophy means, this moment the observer may go, the next time it comes back again. And then again you look at it, again it goes away. If you are really very sensitive, once it happens, it can happen forever. But I do not know if such minds exist in large numbers in the world. There may be an occasional rare mind that once it sees, once for all, the observer is finished and finished forever. But for most minds, the observer comes back again and again. If in no other form, it will come in this form, I must make my inquiry alone by myself. Because there is no guru, there is nobody else. Do you understand what I am saying? Or, I made this inquiry by myself. And if somebody asks you, and who are you, because there is no observer, then who made the inquiry? If the observer is not there, the experience is not there, who made the inquiry? But you keep the observer again and again by these assertions and declarations. And therefore the conflict continues in one form or the other. So thought, it is very important to see how thought takes various forms after an initial inquiry and continues to survive and does not totally surrender. That's the hardest work, that's the process. So that's not a psychological process. That's not a process in psychological time. That may be a chronological process, process in time, a factual process. But increasingly you have to live in this energy. The mind has to learn to live in this energy without creating these new observers, seeing the dangers of making these observers and assertions and declarations, living simply and letting the energy operate on the various levels of the psyche, the various levels of the body. Now what happens is, people come to this energy, come to a relative freedom from conflict, live their life sanely, but there are many other problems of human life which are not met completely. Now, <clears throat> as I said, when many people came to this energy of freedom, some got caught because they got into this opposite. When you posit an opposite, that the soul or the spirit is separate from the body, then the body can be discarded and the spirit is freed. Then the body is going to suffer. If, if the body is neglected, the body will suffer from cancer, diseases and things like that. And it's very strange and surprising. People like Ramakrishna and Raman Maharshi, they died of cancer. I'm not saying that 
that I am immune to all that, I am not making any declaration. But I would only say, if I die of cancer, of course I won't be there. Those of you who will be there, please understand that there must have been some limitation left in the inquiry. Do you understand? <laughs> if I keep on suffering from asthma and difficulty of breathing and headaches, please understand that there is some limitation in inquiry. If I am suffering from some form of lack, unhappiness, sorrow, wanting, sickness, disorder, disease, there is something lacking in the inquiry. The movement has not gone further. You could say, and now the only question comes, Vita, you were asking the other day, when intelligence operates, why does the intelligence not cure cancer? Fortunately, the God we are discovering is not a dictatorial God. You know, the absolute God would be dictatorial, say, look, you will have to cure your cancer. And you will have to cure your cough. God says, look, here is the intelligence, here is all the means at your disposal, all the knowledge is available. Now you can hang yourself or you can live a happy life up to you. This is your freedom. So if the intelligence was autocratic, dictatorial, there will be no scope for freedom. That God, that intelligence will be authoritative, oppressive. The role of intelligence is to discover, within the framework of freedom, how human life should live. The whole question of evil in the world also is for the same reason, that the human mind has a choice to live this way or that way. Only that mind which has come to a certain understanding has no choice. The mind which has come to an understanding has no choice to live in conflict. But a mind which is living in conflict has a choice to live in conflict. It is not compelled to do away with its conflict. Only when it is living in conflict, the conflict will keep on increasing, it will not decrease. The pain and sorrow will keep on increasing. And human mind has a marvelous capacity to coexist and adapt itself to pain, sorrow and everything. And then it says, it's my freedom. So if you choose it to be your freedom, to live in pain or sorrow or cancer, nobody is going to stop you. You are still enlightened. Do you understand? Any questions? Without it being thought. You will understand it <coughs> non-verbally by going deeper into it. You will know more and more about it. You will understand its operation more and more. But it will be non-verbal. It will not be an intellectual understanding, it will be total understanding, a total experience. So, experiencing as a whole, that understanding you may not be able to communicate to someone else. It may be difficult. But for you, you can understand what it is. But it's not understanding in terms of thought. It's not uh, understanding in terms of thought, because thought is stopped already. Thought cannot reach there. It can only imagine, it can only approximate, because reason fails here. Reason has a cause and effect. It operates through the level of cause and effect. And when you come to this point, then cause is the effect. There is no gap, no distance between cause and effect. And there's no questioning hmm? It seems that there's no questioning that. Question? Questioner. There's no questioning. No, questioning, with questioning, there is only deeper contact with the energy. The contact with the energy is the only answer, is the only question. <laughs> to live in this communion, in this energy, is the question, is the answer. A and I tell you, uh, when you understand this thing, sometimes a marvelous thing happens. We all know it intellectually, but sometimes when you s really realize it in life, a marvelous thing happens. Once, in India, last year, I had some, uh, some stomach upset, some diarrhea. 
and I didn't want to take any medicine. I just tried to change my diet and all that, but it didn't improve. It was turning almost into dysentery. So I decided last of all to go on a fast next day. That now fasting is the best thing, you know, fasting according to natural science, natural hygiene principle or nature cure principle, <coughs> fasting is the best treatment for all diseases. And so I decided to go on a fast from next day. When I got up in the morning, I felt that I have been fasting already for so many days. The very idea of fast at night was enough to produce the effect of fasting by morning. The thought of fast. <laughs> Feeling hungry, exhausted, weak. <laughs> it was just as usual. <laughs> Some bitter taste in the mouth. So in the morning when I was meditating, while meditation, a thought came in my mind. It came like an inspiration, like a revelation. And thought was like this, you see. Question was, what is the cause of joy? The answer was, I am. What is the cause of sorrow? The answer was, I am. What is the cause of good health? The answer was, I am. What is the cause of sickness? The answer was, I am. I am the cause and I am the effect. There is nothing else excepting I am. And I said, to my mind immediately something clicked. I said, look, if there is only one cause and one effect and nothing else, how can there be dysentery? How can there be disease? And in the moment I seem that I am all right now, there is no trouble. The healing took place in that very realization. But it is not an intellectual thing, it is not assertion or I was not repeating that formula or mantra. It just came as a realization, as a question. What is the cause and what is the effect? And I said to Martha, I said, look Martha, I am going to have my meal today, I am going to have my food, I am not going to fast, I am alright. And I was alright. So this is what I mean, the operation of the energy in life, when you see I am the cause and I am the effect. Any moment you can realize this unity of life, miracle happens. It has nothing to do with repetition of mantra or self-hypnosis or assertions, not that. But just the realization, realization, but realization will only come in silence when you are putting a problem. My problem was the symptom. My problem was ill health. But I am not trying to remove ill health by good health. I am not taking any medicine, I am not suggesting, look, I am better and better and better and better every way and every day, I am not saying that. <laughs> I am not saying, I am not sick, I am healthy. I am not saying any of those things. So it is not self-hypnosis or auto-suggestion or assertion or affirmation or denial, but just looking at the problem and asking the question. And when the question is correct question, the answer clicks and you find the thing has happened. So this is how the energy is brought into operation on your physical and psychic levels. When diseases disappear, when problems disappear. And then you know that here is an energy, here is the power, here is the force in whom you can trust in whom you can play, put your reliance. There is nothing to worry, nothing to fear. Thought will frighten you. Immediately thought comes, thought will frighten you. But whenever you could look at the whole structure of thought and go beyond thought and the energy is contacted and is brought into focus in life, life is changed, things are changed. Your body is changed, your mind is changed. This has been another comfy time on the couch in the levity zone with Dr. Bruce and Dr. Kaushik. 
Find all podcast audio available for remixing in your projects under our Creative Commons license at www.levityzone.com. Contribute your own voice, art, music, and writings to the Levity Zone for remixing or inclusion in our nifty podcast shelf system. We are looking for those who would like to engage in trialogue dialogues online to create uplifting and insightful conversations to include as future podcasts. Please get in touch with us if you would like to record such a conversation. Topics? The future of humanity, the planet, science, sustainability and permaculture, good and right living, spiritual development, whatever topics you feel would fit the levity zone and are important to your life. So get in touch. This is Dr. Bruce signing off.